My name is Chap, the tech chap. <laughs> okay, let me explain. Basically, this is gonna be James Bond's phone. Well, maybe not his actual phone, although it would be fun to see Daniel Craig talk about what his daily driver is. But this is the Nokia 8.35G, and it's the phone that presumably Nokia is spending a ton of money on to feature as the new Bond phone in the upcoming movie, No Time to Die. Okay, that's better. It was getting far too hard in that tuxedo. But anyway, marketing aside, this is Nokia's new flagship phone, the 8.3 5G, and it'll save you back 500 pounds or $700. So it's firmly in the not quite flagship, but trying to be better than the usual mid-range type of phone category. It's also Nokia's first 5G phone, although it only supports sub six gigahertz 5G, not MM Wave, but that's not the end of the world. And Nokia says this supports more 5G bands than any other 5G phone right now. So what exactly makes this stand out other than the fact that maybe Daniel Craig may have it in his pocket? Well, for me, recent Nokias have always been about having that fast and pure Android software, good cameras, or at least interesting cameras, like last year's Nokia 9 PureView, and also not costing an arm and a leg. And so with Android One, a quad camera setup, and a 500 pound price tag, this should be good. Now, the first time you pick this up, your first impression is gonna be, this is a big phone. I mean, it's 8.9 millimeters thick, it weighs 220 grams, and we get a 6.81 inch screen. It really is a bit of a chunky monkey. And while the bezels are pretty thin around three of the edges, we do have a bit of a chin at the bottom here. But if you do want that big phone, big screen experience, then it's fine. And I think it's a pretty good looking phone overall. We get Gorilla Glass on the back, although there's no word on the front, so I'm guessing not. But the takeaway is, while it looks fairly smart, it does feel a little bit plasticky. It's also very slippery to hold. I do like this Polar Night color though, and hopefully you do as well, because, well, there aren't actually any other choices. We get this circular camera module on the back. The power button here on the right doubles as a fingerprint reader, which I actually quite like, and it does feel more comfortable given its size than, say, an in-screen reader. But then on the other side, slightly bizarrely, we have a dedicated Google Assistant button. And as much as I'm trying to get used to it, I keep pressing the wrong one to unlock it. It kind of reminds me of Samsung's Bixby button in that we just don't really need it, and it's more hassle than it's worth. We also don't get any wireless charging, and come to think of it, I don't think there's any IP water resistance rating either. There is a headphone jack though, if you're still into that sort of thing, but we do only get a single, fairly average speaker, which is a little bit disappointing. So headphones are definitely the way to go. We've taken the lead. So let's talk specs. And we get a Snapdragon 765G chip, which isn't quite a flagship 865, but it's more than powerful enough for any game or app right now, alongside six or eight gigs of RAM and 64 or 128 gigs of storage, plus micro SD support. We also get a good sized 4,500 milliamp hour battery. And I find that I still have about 30% of my battery left at the end of the day. So no complaints there. You should be able to get a good day and a half out of this with a bit of rationing. But for me, one of the biggest selling points is the software. It runs Android 10, but because it's an Android one phone, I know that's slightly confusing, but it means that you're essentially getting the Google Pixel experience. So there's no skins or horrible, ugly UI on top or tons of bloatware. Just pure vanilla Android, which also means it'll be one of the first phones to get updates like Android 11. So far so good then, but what lets this down a little bit, I think, is the screen. It's LCD rather than AMOLED, and it's also only 60 Hertz. Neither of which are really deal breakers, but so many phones now offer smoother 90 or 120 Hertz screens, even the 200 pound Poco X3, for example. And it does make a difference to how fast everything feels. Will the average person going into a phone store really care or mind that much about 60 versus 90 Hertz? Probably not is the answer. And I think that's why, you know, Apple probably don't have that much to worry about with the iPhone 12 if they do go with 60 Hertz. But given the fact that you can get lots of other phones in this price range with high refresh rates, it's a little bit disappointing. Having said that, the screen still looks pretty good. And by default, this pure display is turned on, which boosts everything up. So it's sharper and punchier. It certainly makes videos and games pop a little bit more, but it can feel a little bit artificial and over sharpened sometimes. One of my biggest criticisms right now though is when it comes to auto brightness. I think there's a bug or at least it's not working quite right. And I know a few other reviewers have had this issue, but even in bright sunlight, sometimes it will just lower the brightness right down without you doing anything. So you can't even see the phone. So it seems a bit hit or miss the uh, auto brightness detector, but hopefully that's something they can fix in a software update. Now let's talk about this camera. We get four lenses with the main one being 64 megapixels. I mean, considering they've partnered with Zeiss Optics and we're getting that pure view camera brand you would expect this to be pretty good. 
We also get a 12 megapixel 120 degree ultra wide lens, but unfortunately no telephoto. So while you can zoom in, it's digital only. So there's the main lens, the ultra wide, and then we have a two megapixel macro and a two megapixel depth sensor. So it completes that marketing friendly quad camera setup, which every phone manufacturer and a dog seems to want to put into their handsets these days. The depth lens should help with portrait shots to some extent, but I still find the bokeh blur a bit artificial looking. And the macro is pretty much useless. The quality just isn't good enough. So we get the usual array of modes, including a night mode, and the longer exposure adds more light and detail, but it does start to struggle if it gets too dark. Nokia is also putting a lot of emphasis on video. You can shoot in 4K, which is pretty standard these days, and also 21 by 9 ultra wide if you want to give it a bit more of a cinematic feel. But there's nothing really that special to write home about here. And then around the front, we have a 24 megapixel selfie camera, although for some reason, selfie portraits seem to go really dark and contrasty. So the question is, should you actually buy the Nokia 8.3 5G? Well, it is a good phone. I love the software. We get solid performance, good battery life. And I think it looks quite nice, although it's not maybe the most sophisticated or most premium phone out there. But I think as a package, it does a pretty good job especially given the price, as I say, about 500 pounds. So that is worth bearing in mind that of course you're not gonna get, you know, Galaxy Note 20 Ultra cans of level of premiumness and finish and features. This is a 500 pound or $700 phone. But that argument goes both ways because while versus flagships, this may look like a pretty good deal. There are so many other budget mid-range phones now that actually make this look a little bit outdated. And I think there are just a few too many compromises here. 60 Hertz, LCD, single speaker, no water resistance, no wireless charge, charging, it's pretty bulky, and the macro and depth lenses aren't that useful. I think six months ago even, most of this could be forgiven, but competition, as I say, in the mid-range has got so strong recently. And the likes of the OnePlus Nord and the Moto G 5G Plus, for example, are better in almost every way. Plus, if you do just want that stock Android experience, then the Pixel 4a or the upcoming Pixel 5 may be a better option. So perhaps if Nokia or HMD Global, who uh, actually own Nokia, maybe spent a bit less money on the James Bond marketing budget and a bit more on the handset itself, then we'd be in a better place. But while there's nothing wrong with this phone, and I think if you do buy it, you'll be pretty happy with it, given the price and the features, I just think there are better options out there. But what do you reckon? Would you be tempted to buy this? Do you think I'm being a bit too harsh? And did I just completely ruin the video with that stupid James Bond skit at the beginning? Let me know in the comments below. And if you do want to see more from me, then make sure you hit that little subscribe button below. I've got loads more videos coming out this week. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next time right here on The Tech Chat.